Hello, and welcome to this presentation on complex numbers in Cartesian form. This presentation assumes you've seen a previous presentation related to arithmetic operations in Cartesian form. Here we're going to look at powers of j, something like 5j to the 34, and also how to solve complex number equations in Cartesian form. Presentation overview. This presentation does assume you've seen the previous presentation on complex numbers and specifically Cartesian form, where we introduced complex numbers and applications of complex numbers. We reviewed the Cartesian form of complex numbers and also how to add, subtract, multiply and divide using the Cartesian form. In this presentation, we will specifically look at the powers of J, higher powers of J, J to the 3, J to the 4, etc. And also how to solve complex number equations in Cartesian form. Reference materials included at the end on which this presentation was based and I would strongly encourage you to refer to these reference sources for a more complete understanding of complex numbers. Let us consider the powers of j. We know that j to the 1 is equal to the square root of negative 1, so that's j by definition. j squared, j times j, would be the square root of negative 1, or squared. That would actually be negative 1, a real number. j cubed, which is j times j times j, can be written as j squared times by j, j to the 1. We use in here basically the first law of indices to write in that format. Don't forget there's a 1 here, but we don't write the 1s. We know from above that j squared is equal to negative 1, so negative 1 times j is negative j, so j cubed is negative j. If we consider j to the 4, which could be written from the first law of indices as j squared times j squared, then j squared is negative 1, multiplied by negative 1 gives us positive 1, a real number. Note the result j to the 4, as every time it occurs, we can simply replace the value by unity, or 1. Let's consider higher powers of j, j to the 5. Now using the first law of indices above, that could be written as j to the 4 multiplied by j, is j to the 5. We know from above that j to the 4 is actually 1, so multiply 1 by j, and we get j, so j to the 5 is j. Let's consider j to the 6. Again, in indices format, that could be written as j to the 4 times j to the 2 from the first law j to the 4 is 1 from above, multiplied by j squared, and j squared is negative 1 from above, so 1 times negative 1 is negative 1, so j to the 6 is negative 1. j to the 7, we be written as j to the 4 times j to the 3, j to the 4 is 1, j to the 3 from above is negative j, so 1 times negative j is negative j, so j to the 7 is negative j. Let's consider j to the 8. j to the 8 can be written as j to the 4 times j to the 4, which is basically 1 times 1, which is equal to 1. So notice the pattern has been repeated. We've got the j, the negative 1, the negative j, and the positive 1. And this is a repeating pattern. From here on in, it would continue to repeat in that sequence. If we were to plot the repeating pattern on the Argan diagram, we would have 1 on the imaginary axis. We would have negative 1 on the real axis, we would have negative 1 on the imaginary axis for negative j, and we would have 1 on the real axis. Knowing the above results can sometimes help simplify problems involving complex numbers. Example 5. We're asked to simplify the following powers of j. a is j to the 11, b is j to the 12, c is j to 21, and d is negative 5 divided by j to the 9. Our a, we've got j to the 11. So using the first law of indices again, we can write that as j to the 4, multiplied by j to the 4, multiplied by j to the 3. Noting that j to the 4 is 1, multiplied by 1, multiplied by j to the 3 on the previous slide, was negative j. So 1 times 1 times negative j is negative j. So j to 11 is negative j. 
part B, we've got j to the 12. That could be written using the third law of indices, using this law here, of a power raised to a power. So we could write that as j to the 4 raised to the power 3, that would be j to the 12, but we note that j to the 4 is 1, so 1 cubed, 1 to the power of 3, is 1. So j to the 12 is 1. Part C, we've got j to the 21. Again, using the third law of indices, we can write that as j to the 4 raised to the power of 5. That's j to the 20. And then from the first law, we can multiply that by j to the 1 to give us j to the 21. Again, we notice that j to the 4 is 1 raised to the power of 5 multiplied by j. But 1 raised to the power of 5 is 1, so 1 times j is j. So j to 21 is j. And finally, part d. We're given negative 5 divided by j to the 9. So that could be written as negative 5 divided by j to the 4 raised to the power of 2 multiplied by j. So again, using the third law and the first law of indices here. That can be written as negative 5 divided by j to the 4 is 1 raised to the power of 2 multiplied by j. So that's negative 5 divided by j. Now we use the complex conjugate to simplify further. So I multiply top and bottom by the complex conjugate of j, so the complex conjugate is negative j. So on the top I'll get negative 5 times negative j is positive 5j, and on the bottom I'll get positive j times negative j, that's negative j squared. Again, j squared is negative 1, so I get 5j divided by the double negatives there make a positive, so it's 5j divided by 1, or simply 5j. Hence, to simplify powers of j, we simply take the highest powers of j to the 4 that's possible. Then the result will simplify to one of the four previous results on the previous slide of j, negative 1, negative j, or positive 1. Exercise 4, we're asked to simplify the following powers of j. So part A, we've got j to the 16. Part B, we've got j to the 23. And part C, we've got 3 divided by j to the 13. I'd encourage you to stop the presentation here and attempt these three little questions. The answers are given in the brackets on the right-hand side. Four solutions are shown on the following slides. Exercise four solutions. We're asked to simplify the following powers of j in part a. Simplify j to the 16, part b, j to the 23, and part c, 3 divided by j to the 13. Solutions are given below, and they're very similar to those of example 5, so I'll let you wander through them at your own pace. Just notice within the various questions where we've used j to the 4, don't forget j to the 4 is a value of 1, so that's been used in all of the questions to help simplify them. Also note in part C of exercise 4, we didn't need to use the complex conjugate in this particular case, because we end up with a denominator of j squared, don't forget j squared is a value of negative 1. I'd encourage you to stop the presentation here and review those solutions in detail so you fully understand the steps involved. Here are some tutorial questions related to the powers of j. In question 15, we're asked to evaluate part a, j to the 8, part b, j to the 11, part c, 3 divided by j cubed, and part d, 5 upon j to the 6. The answers are shown in the square bracket. Question 16, we're asked to evaluate part A, 1 plus j to the power of 4. So be careful with that. What I encourage you to do there is to expand 1 plus j times 1 plus j, and then simplify that, and then square the answer of that simplification to get the 1 plus j to the 4. Part B, we're asked to simplify 2 minus j divided by 2 plus j. That will be a complex conjugate problem multiplying the top and bottom terms by the complex conjugate 2 minus j. Expand the brackets and simplify. And part c, we've got 1 over 2 plus j, 3. So again, multiply top and bottom by the complex conjugate, and then simplify. The answers are again shown in square brackets below. Tutorial questions, powers of j continued. Question 17. A given complex number z is equal to 1 plus j3 divided by 1 minus j2. We're asked to evaluate z squared in this case in the form a plus jb. 
Cartesian form. I suggest you do here is multiply top and bottom by the complex conjugate of 1 minus J2. So that will be 1 plus J2. Expand the brackets and simplify. Answers are shown in the square bracket on the right hand side. Question 18. We're asked to evaluate part A, J to the 33. I'll let you consider that on your own. In part B, we're given 1 divided by 2 minus J2, all raised to the power of 4. What I encourage you to consider here is a denominator. Expand 2 minus J2 to the power of 2. Simplify the terms, and then that solution expand again to the power of 2, and that will give you 2 minus J2 all to the power of 4. Then multiply by the complex conjugate to simplify the solution further. In part C, we're given two fractions. The first one is 1 plus J3 divided by 2 plus J4. And we add to that the second fraction, 3 minus J2 over 5 minus J. What I encourage you to do is take the first fraction, multiply top and bottom by the complex conjugate, and then simplify. And then consider the second fraction again, multiply the top and bottom by the complex conjugate and simplify. And then add the terms together, the real and imaginary part. Solution is shown again in the square brackets. Solution of equations involving complex numbers in Cartesian form. In example 6 here, we're given the complex equation x plus 2 minus j is equal to 5 plus j3 minus jy. And what we have to do with this example is to get the x and the jy terms all on one side of the equation and then the real and imaginary terms on the other side. And we just simply equate real on the left with real on the right and imaginary on the left with imaginary on the right. So in this case, given the equation x plus 2 minus j is equal to 5 plus j3 minus jy, the object here is to get the x and jy on the same side and all the real and imaginary numbers on the other. So the easiest way in this particular case is to take 2 from both sides and add j to both sides. We'll get the minus 2 and plus j on the right hand side. And if I add jy to both sides, I will then end up with my x plus jy is equal to on the right hand side. 5 take away 2 is 3 and j3 plus 1j is j4. All I do now is simply equate left and right hand sides. So equating the real parts. On the left and right hand side, I get x on the left with 3 on the right. And then equating the imaginary parts, on the left I get y, and on the right hand side I get 4. So in this case, x is equal to 3 and y is equal to 4. So that's solution of a complex equation involving the real and imaginary components. Tutorial questions related to solving complex equations in the Cartesian form x plus jy. In question 19, we're given 4 multiplied by in brackets a plus jb, and that's equal to 7 minus j3. Here you could simply divide both sides by 4, and you end up with the solution. The answers are shown in the square brackets here. Question 20. In this particular case, you've already got the x plus jy on the right-hand side. On the left-hand side, you need to expand these binomial brackets and simplify, and then equate the x to the real parts and the y to the imaginary parts. Again, solutions shown in square brackets. Question 21. Again, I would encourage you to expand on the left-hand side the binomial brackets and simplify, and then equate to the right-hand side. Just be careful of the format in there to make sure you have the same formatting for the real and imaginary on the left and the right hand side. Answers are shown in the square brackets. Question 22 actually shows you brackets around these terms here. You don't really need the brackets in this particular case. There is no change of sign to worry about. What I would encourage you to do though is to get the real and the imaginary parts on the left hand side together and then equate the real parts on the left hand side with the real part on the right hand side and that will form an equation with two unknowns a and b and then form a second equation with the imaginary parts on the left hand side and the imaginary part on the right hand side this plus six in this case and that will form another equation in terms of a and b and then you have to solve simultaneously to find the values of a and b in this particular case the values are shown in the square bracket 
question 23. In this particular case, you're going to have to square both sides to actually get rid of the square root sign on the right-hand side. You need to remove that before you can solve the problem. So you need to square both sides. So you'll end up with, on the left-hand side, 5 plus j2 all squared. So that's a binomial expansion. Expand your brackets and then equate the real and imaginary terms together. Again, the solutions are shown in the square brackets. I would encourage you to stop the video and attempt these questions for solving for x and jy in Cartesian form, but the solutions are shown on the following slides. Here are the solutions to the complex equations. Question 19, we were given 4 multiplied by bracket a plus jb is equal to 7 minus j3. For this particular question, simply dividing throughout by 4 initially, allowed you to get the a plus jb format on the left hand side, the real plus the imaginary, and on the right hand side we had in brackets 7 minus j3 all divided by 4. When you equate the real parts in this equation, the a will equal to the 7 upon 4, so a is 7 upon 4. When you equate the imaginary parts, the b will equal to the minus 3 upon 4, and that's what we find the final solution. Solution to question 20, we're given the equation x plus jy is equal to, on the right-hand side, 3 plus j4 in brackets multiplied by 2 minus j3. Basically, it's a question of expanding the brackets on the right-hand side, collecting the right terms together. Notice when a j squared term occurs, we replace that with a negative one, and then be careful of the double negatives that sometimes occur. You should get down to an equation x plus jy is equal to 18 minus j. So equating the real parts, on the left hand side, x is equal to the 18, that's the real part comparison. And then equating the imaginary parts, we've got the y is equal to minus 1 in this case. So y is equal to minus 1. Solution to question 21. We were given j open bracket p plus jq inside the bracket. And that was equal to 1 plus j in a bracket multiplied by 2 minus j in a bracket. What I've done on both sides here is expand the brackets. So on the left-hand side, I've expanded it with the j, so I get j times p plus the j squared notice times the q. On the right-hand side, I get a binomial expansion of brackets. On the left-hand side, notice the j squared can be written as negative 1. On the right-hand side, we eventually get a j squared formed, and again, we write that as negative 1. I'll let you follow the calculations through here. What you should end up with is on the left hand side jp that's the imaginary part minus the q and on the right hand side you end up with 3 minus j just be careful here when you equate the real parts you're equating the minus q is a real part with the positive 3 so q is equal to negative 3 so be careful of that and when you equate the imaginary parts you'll end up with p is equal to minus 1, that's a minus 1j. So just be careful with that solution, it's slightly more complicated. Question 22 solution. Although on the left hand side we were given the terms in brackets, they didn't really need the brackets in this particular case because there's no change of sign to worry about. So we could simply write the left hand side as a minus j3b plus b minus j to a and that's equal to on the right hand side 4 plus j6. What I've done on our next line is put the real numbers to the front so a plus b are the real numbers and the imaginary numbers are the minus j to a and the minus 3b and that's equal to 4 plus j6. Now when you equate the real parts this time on the left hand side a plus b are the real parts of the equation so two unknowns there and that's equal to the 4 on the right hand side. So what you're finding is we're going to have two equations to solve it. There's two unknowns in that equation, so that cannot be solved. So we're going to have to generate a simultaneous equation. If I rearrange the equation, a plus b is equal to 4, to read a is equal to 4 minus the b, I'm going to call that equation 1. Looking at the imaginary parts left and right, I have negative 2a and then minus the 3b, and that's equal to 6 on the right-hand side for the imaginary number. I've called that equation 2. I'm now going to solve the simultaneous equation. I'm going to use substitution here. So I'm going to substitute equation 1 into 2. So equation 1 above the 4 minus b 
that gets placed into equation 2 for the A term. I'll let you look at the rearrangement of the equation there. What you should find is that B is equal to negative 14. And when you back substitute the value of B into equation 1, you should find that A is equal to positive 18. I'll let you look at that solution in your own time. Solution to question 23. We were given in this question the square root of e plus jf, in the bracket I've written on the left-hand side here, is equal to 5 plus j2. To begin with, with this question, we need to square both sides to get rid of the square root. Let's get rid of that first of all. So we start with e plus jf is equal to 5 plus j2 all squared. And of course, that's a binomial bracket to expand. From there on in, the solution is very similar to previous questions. Again, just be careful where you get a j squared term. That will revert to a negative 1 value. What you should find when you equate the real parts is that the e on the left-hand side equates to 21 on the right-hand side. And when you equate the imaginary parts, you should end up with f on the left-hand side is equal to 20 on the right-hand side. Here is the bibliography used to generate the presentation. Some very good textbooks here. I would strongly encourage you to refer to these for further information. Several from the same authors. And some older textbooks. Again, very good textbooks uh, that help with understanding of complex numbers. I hope this has been of use to you and thank you for viewing.